Welcome once more to this YouTube channel. Kindly subscribe to this channel. The topic is pelvis. We are looking at the pelvic girdle, male and female pelvises, pelvic diameters, and pelvic fractures. So, an introduction by way of introduction to the pelvis. The pelvis is a region in the body. The pelvis is the space enclosed by the pelvic girdle. The pelvis is the part of the trunk which is inferior and posterior to the abdomen and is the area of transition between the trunk and the lower limbs. Remember that anatomically the pelvis is the space or compartment surrounded by the pelvic girdle that is the bony framework of the pelvis. It's also, you also have part of the appendicular skeleton of the lower limb. The pelvis is subdivided into greater and lesser pelvis. The greater pelvis gives protection to the inferior abdominal organs. Uh, just the way you have the inferior part of the thoracic cage protecting the superior abdominal organs. So the abdominal organs are always protected either by the greater pelvis or the thorax. The lesser pelvis provides the skeletal framework for both the pelvic cavity and the perineum, that's part of the trunk. And uh, the lesser pelvis is separated from the perineum by what we call the musculofacial pelvic diaphragm. So don't forget that the pelvis, you have a greater pelvis and a lesser pelvis. Externally, when you look at the pelvis, it's covered by the inferior anterior lateral abdominal wall muscles. Anteriorly, you also have the gluteal region of the lower limb covering it posterior laterally, and then the perineum overlaps inferiorly. Right here is an illustration of the anterior view of the pelvis. You can see the right and left hip bones and then the sacrum making up the pelvis and then the hip bones there you can see the ilium colored differently from the ischium and the pubis the pubis has a light green color the ischium has a kind of purple color and then the ilium is the upper upper part of the hip bone there and then the sacrum so the pelvis is made up of the right and left hip bones and the sacrum that's what because makes up the pelvic girdle and all that is illustrated in this diagram so the pelvic girdle is basin shaped is actually a basin shaped ring of bones that connect the vertebral column to the two femurs right here is an illustration of the pelvic girdle you can see the right and left hip bones with the sacrum and the hip bones are articulating with the femur with the heads of the femur and also articulating with the vertebra colon via the sacrum the sacrum is articulating with the fifth lumbar vertebra all that is seen clearly in the illustration the pelvic girdle like i said is basin shaped is a basin shaped ring of bones that connects the vertebral column to the two femurs. It has some very important primary functions, and the primary functions are to bear the weight of the upper body when one is sitting and also when one is standing. The pelvic girdle also transfers that weight from the axial to the lower appendicular skeleton while you are standing and walking. The pelvic girdle provides attachment for the powerful muscles of locomotion and posture as well as the muscles of the abdominal wall. And as these muscles are contracting, the pelvic girdle is there to just put up with all that. What about the secondary functions of the pelvic girdle? If we have primary functions, there are also secondary functions. The secondary functions of the pelvic girdle are to contain and protect the pelvic viscera, that's the pelvic organs. These pelvic organs include the inferior parts of the urinary tract and then the internal reproductive organs. And then you also have the intestines there, 
which are inferior abdominal visceral organs. And uh, the pelvic girdle also permits passage of the terminal parts of the fetus, of the, of the terminal parts of these um, inferior abdominal or viscera, that's intestines. And then in the, fit, in the females, very important, you have the pelvic girdle permitting the, permitting the passage of the full-time fetus. And then the fetus goes on through the perineum and then the child is born. We're still talking about the secondary functions of the pelvic girdle. It gives support to the abdominal pelvic viscera. That's the organs you have in the abdomen and pelvis and also supports the pregnant uterus. The pelvic girdle also gives attachment to the erectile bodies of the external genitalia, very important in the male. The pelvic girdle provides attachment for muscles and membranes that assist in form forming the pelvic floor. And you have gaps that are filled there. There are existing gaps and deficiencies in the pelvic floor, all that is formed by the, is filled by the muscles and these muscles are attached to the bony framework, that's the pelvic girdle. Now let's take a look at the bones and features of the pelvic girdle. What are the bones that you have in the pelvic girdle? The pelvic girdle is formed by three bones, I've mentioned them before. You have the right and left hip bones, what you also call the coxal bones also called the pelvic bones and then you have the sacrum the right and left hip bones are quite large they are irregularly shaped and you find that each of these hip bones develops from the fusion of three bones and the three bones are the ilium the isium and the pubis then i said the pelvic girdle in addition to the right and left hip bones you also have the sacrum forming the pelvic girdle and the sacrum is formed by the fusion of five originally separate sacrum vertebrae. Right here is an illustration of the bones of the pelvic girdle. You have the sacrum colored yellow there. And then the right and left hip bones have some what kind of red color in the diagram. The right and left hip bones at the upper end there you have the ilium. Then when you go inferiorly, Towards the medial aspect, you have the pubic bone, and then towards the lateral aspect, you have inferiorly, you have the ischium. So you must not forget that the pubic, pelvic girdle, like you can see, it has an internal or pelvic aspect, which you can see in the illustration there. The internal, what, what we call the medial or pelvic aspect of the hip bones, is bound by the pelvis and it forms the lateral walls of the pelvis. You also have the external part of the pelvic girdle which is involved in giving attachment for the lower limb muscles. So you have the hip bone made up of the ilium, ischium and the pubis. And uh, we must not forget that in infants and children, the hip bones consist of three separate bones that are united by a triradiate cartilage. Triradiate because it radiates in three directions. And you find this cartilage at the acetabulum, which is a cup-like depression in the lateral surface of the hip bone. And this, the acetabulum articulates with the head of the femur. Right here is an illustration of the triradiate cartilage that you find at the acetabulum. So you can see the ilium colored somewhat red there or orange and then the ischium colored green and the pubis colored lemon colored. The three bones are united at the triradiate cartilage which is like a white shape there you see in the middle at the acetabulum. Don't forget that after puberty, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis fuse to form the hip bone, the way it is in the adult.
the two hip bones are joined anteriorly at the pubic symphysis. You can see that in the illustration we had earlier on. And articulate posteriorly with the sacrum at the sacroiliac joint to form the pelvic girdle. So the two, two hip bones, they join anteriorly at the pubic symphysis and they also articulate posteriorly with the sacrum at the sacroiliac joints to form the pelvic girdle. The ilium, you can see an illustration of the ilium right there. The ilium is the superior fan-shaped part of the hip bone. It has an ala, you can see that in the diagram, or the wing, which represents the spread of a fan, hence the name. It also has body and it has the handle or fan. All that is illustrated in the diagram. The external aspect of the ilium is where you find the body participating in formation of the acetabulum. On the diagram, you can appreciate that there is a part we call the iliac crest, the rim of the fan. And that, it has a curve, it, it's in form of a curve, and it follows the contour of the ala and uh, between the anterior and posterior superior iliac spines. So you have an ala, which is curved there, and then you have, at the anterior aspect, you have anterior superior iliac spine, and then you have anterior inferior, anterior, you have posterior superior iliac spines. Still looking at the ilium, the anterior medial concave surface of the ala of the ilium forms what we call the iliac fossa. You can see that on the, in the diagram. Posteriorly, still looking at the ilium, the sacropelvic surface of the ilium features what we call the iliac tuberosity, an articular surface. And this iliac tuberosity is important because it takes part in synovial and syndesmotic articulation with the sac sacrum. It forms two articulations with the sacrum. The isium has a body and a ramus. The isium is also illustrated here in a diagram showing the hip bone, well demarcated showing the ilium, the isium, and the pubis. The isium is colored blue there. The isium has a body and a ramus. The body of the isium helps form the acetabulum. And the ramus of the isium forms part of the obturator foramen. You can see the foramen right there. The large posterior inferior protuberance of the isium is what we call the ischial tuberosity. There is also a small pointed posterior medial projection near the junction of the ramus and body of the ischium. And this projection is called the ischial spine. The concavity between the ischial spine and the ischial tuberosity is what we call the lesser sciatic notch. Then you have a larger concavity, which we call the greater sciatic notch. This one is superior to the ischial spine and is formed in part also by the ilium. So between the, superior to the ischial spine, between it and the ilium, you have the greater sciatic notch. Now we need to talk about the pubis. We have been looking at the hip joint, we've talked about the ilium, the ischium, and now the pubis. The pubis is also illustrated there with a kind of red, red color. The pubis is an angulated bone with a superior pubic ramus. You can see it there, which helps form the acetabulum. And there is also an inferior pubic ramus, which helps form the obturator foramen. You can see it right there. A thickening on the anterior part of the body of the pubis forms the pubic crest. 
and this ends laterally as a swelling we call the pubic tubercle. The lateral part of the superior pubic ramus has an oblique ridge, and this oblique ridge is called the what? Pectin pubis, or the pectinal, pectinal line of the pubis. Right here is an illustration of the greater and uh, the lesser pelvis. The greater and lesser pelvis. The greater pelvis is shown there as green color. So the green colored part is the great, greater pelvis, which is also called the false pelvis. And then the lesser pelvis is the yellow colored part. The lesser pelvis is also called the true pelvis. Don't forget that the pelvis is divided into greater pelvis, which is the false pelvis, and then lesser pelvis, which is the true pelvis. And this division is by an oblique plane of the pelvic inlet. The pelvic inlet is also called the superior pelvic aperture. And then you have the bony edge. The pelvic inlet is actually the bony edge, which is a ring surrounding and defining the pelvic inlet. And you, there is a rim that surrounds and defines the pelvic inlet. And this rim that surrounds and defines the pelvic inlet is called the pelvic brim. So this pelvic brim is formed by what we call the sacral promontory and ala of the sacrum. And what is the sacral promontory? Sacral promontory or ala of the sacrum is actually the superior surface of the lateral part of the sacrum adjacent to the body. So that forms the, the promontory and the ala of the sacrum. And this forms the pelvic rim. The pelvic rim is also formed by a right and left linear termi terminalis, what we call the terminal lines. So they form on the right and the left, they form a continuous oblique ridge. And this oblique ridge, that's the linear terminalis, is made up of what we call the arcuate line and the pectin pubis or pectinal line. So we are looking at the greater and lesser pelvis and then the pelvic rim, the pelvic brim, which I said is made up of the promontory and ala of the sacrum and then the right and left ninal, ninal terminalis. And then the right and left ninal terminalis, I said, is made up of what? The arcuate line and then the pectinal line. And the pectinal line or the pectin pubis and pe pe a pubic crest is formed by the superior border of the superior pubic ramus and the body. You can see the pubic arc in the diagram there of the greater and lesser pubic pubis. At the inferior aspect, you see the pubic arc formed by the ischiopubic rami. That is ischiopubic pubic rami, like the name suggests, formed by both the ischium and then the rami of the ischium and the pubis. So both rami comes together to form uh, the pubic arc. So the width of the suprapubic angle is determined by the distance between the right and left ischial tuberosities which can be measured with the fingers in the vagina during a pelvic examination, a vagina examination. The pelvic outlet, that is the inferior pelvic aperture, is bounded by the pubic arc anteriorly, then the ischial tuberosities laterally, inferior, then you also have the inferior margin of the sacrotuberous ligament, the sacrotuberous ligament runs between the coccyx and the ischial tuberosity posterior laterally. Also, talking about the inferior pelvic, pelvic aperture, that's the pelvic outlet, you also have the tip of the coccyx posteriorly. So let's look at them again. The pelvic outlet bounded by the pubic arc anteriorly, ischial tuberosities laterally, inferior margin of the sacrotuberous ligament posterior laterally, and then the tip of the coccyx posteriorly. Now the boundaries of the pubic of the pelvic outlets are also 
the deep boundaries of the perineum. So the boundaries of the pelvic outlet are also what? The deep boundaries of the perineum. Next, we need to talk about the orientation of the pelvic girdle. Right here is an illustration of the orientation of the pelvic girdle. If you look at the diagram, you can see that there's an anterior pelvic tilt there. There's an anterior pelvic tilt such that when a person is in the anatomical position, the right and left anterior superior iliac spines and the anterior aspect of the pubic symphysis, they lie in the same vertical plane. When you view the pelvic girdle anteriorly, you find out that the tip of the coccyx appears close to the center of the pelvic inlet. And then the pubic bones and the pubic symphysis actually, they, they are tilted such that they form more of a weight-bearing floor. So instead of the pubic bones being anterior, anteriorly placed, it's as if they are tilted, they are actually tilted, forming more of a weight-bearing floor than an anterior wall. So that is the orientation of the pelvis. In the median view, you find out that the sacral promontory is located directly superior to the center of the pelvic outlet, where the perineal body is such that the axis of the pelvis is curved and the curved axis of the pelvis intersects the axis of the abdominal cavity at an oblique angle. So the axis going through the, the axis of the abdominal cavity and that of the pelvis, they meet at an oblique angle. And the axis of the pelvis is actually curved because the pelvis is tilted such that the anterior part, the pubis, now becomes the weight-bearing floor. So that is the tilting of the pelvis. Such is the orientation of the pelvic girdle, as you can see in the diagram. Next, we need to look at the comparison of male and female pel bony pelvises. The male and female bony pelvises are well illustrated in these diagrams. The, in this diagram here, they are quite different. Why? We know that because of the hormones at puberty, the male and ho female hormones are quite different and also the different genetic makeup. So because of that, you see that the bony framework of the male is different from that of the female. So now, comparison of male and female bony pelvises. A good look at the diagram there will help us appreciate all that. Considering the general structure, the male pelvis is thick and heavy, while that of the female is thin and light. Then looking at the greater pelvis, let's look at the diagram there. The male pelvis is right there by your right as you're facing the screen, and the female pelvis is there by the left as you're facing the screen. So the greater pelvis for the male is deep. You can appreciate that in the diagram. For the female, it's shallow. What about the lesser pelvis? It's narrow and deep and tapering in the male. You can see that in the diagram. Then in the female, it's wide, shallow, and cylindrical. In the female, look at the diagram closely, you will see that. This is very good because it helps the female in childbirth. The pelvic inlets are the superior pelvic aperture. In the male, it's heart-shaped and narrow. You can see that in the diagram. In the female, it's oval and round and wide. Look at the diagram, you see that. The pelvic outlet, that's the inferior pelvic aperture, is comparatively small in the male compared to the female, which is large. And then, look at the pelvic, the pubic arc and the subpubic angle. In the male, you look at it there in the diagram, you can see that it's narrow, less than 70 degrees, while in the female, it's wide. What about the obturator foramen? Look at the diagram there. In the male, it's round. In the female, it's oval. The acetabulum is large in the male and it's small in the female. The greater sciatic notch is narrow. It has an inverted V shape in the male. Take a close look. And then in the female, it has, um, it's almost uh, 90 degrees in the female. Don't forget that the, pubic, the pelvic girdles of males and females differ in several respects, as you can see in the illustration there. The sexual differences are related mainly to the build. The males are heavily, uh, heavily built, 
and they have larger muscles owing to their hormones. And then you also have adaptation of the male pelvis. And also the, you have the adaptation of the female pelvis. Very importantly, the lesser pelvis in females, which is well adapted for childbearing. So once you see a, a pubic bone, you see pubic bone, you should be able to look at it and tell if it's male or female. So variations in male and female pelvises, you must not forget that anatomical differences between male and female pelvises are usually clear, and the pelvis of any person may have some features of the opposite sex. Fragments of the pelvic girdle are useful even in determining sex. Next, we need to talk about pelvic dimensions, pelvic diameters, what we call pelvic con conjugates. Right here is an illustration of the diameters. You have the diameters at the pelvic inlet, at the pelvic, within the pelvic cavity, and then at the pelvic outlet. At the pelvic inlet, the anterior posterior diameter is 11 centimeters. Then the transverse diameter is 11, 13 centimeter, and the oblique diameter is 12 centimeter. Then, looking at the pelvic cavity, anterior posterior di um, diameter is 12 centimeter, transverse diameter is 12 centimeter, and also the oblique diameter is 12 centimeter. Then the pelvic outlet, anterior posterior diameter is 13 centimeter, transverse diameter is 11 centimeters, and um, right here is an illustration of the pelvic dimensions at the pelvic inlet and the outlet and within the cavity. They are all illustrated there.